Hello, everyone. This is the Inner Voice Show, part of the Evolving Mind series in the Togetherness Media. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist and the founder of the Awareness Integration Theory. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our mind, thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I will share the tip of the week about looking at fitting too many activities into your day and your busy day and how to do it with ease and finesse. Then I will bring you Dr. Muhammad Nami, the head of the Department of Neuroscience at School of Advanced Medical Science and Technologies in Shiraz University. He is currently a fellow and the member of the AKD Honor Society at Harvard Medical School. And we will be talking about love, fear, sleep, all of it, all of the great emotions. I'd love to hear from you. So connect with me through my website, fujan.com, and follow my social media and message me with your comments and topics of interest. But first, here's the tip of the week. This is Dr. Fujan again, and this is the tip of the week. This week, I've been looking at fitting too many activities into our day. I've been juggling different activities into my already hectic week. New activities and requests showed up and I had to make a decision about how to change and fit it all where it needed to be done into a flowing and yet full calendar. I also have spoken with people who have been juggling work, purchasing a home, dealing with family emergencies, anything you can imagine into their life. So the short answer to the clear structure with lots of flexibility and lots of requests from others to give your, their gift of flexibility to you. The path to that short answer is the following. One, pick important tasks and appointments that are unchangeable and set them up in the calendar. Like, you know, your work schedule, sleep schedule, school schedule. Two, choose the appointments with people who cannot be changed and set them up in your calendar. Three, choose the tasks and appointments that can be changed and locate the possibility of moving them to another time slot. Four, Contact the people with whom you have an appointment and request a time change. Give them some options that work for you and see if they can match one of them. If not, ask them to give you some options which you can choose from. Do this one person at a time so that you only have to negotiate once and that you don't offer the same time spot to too many people. Five, choose tasks that can be done in flexible time and set them up in open time spots. Six, be honest with others about why you need to change the priority of the, and the need for change, and most importantly, your gratitude for their flexibility and allowance for this time change. Seven, take a deep breath, relax your body, and become present fully. Although this process can be stressful, the ability to do this with ease and finesse is the key. Being fully present at every task and every appointment is very important. At times, people do the act of changing their cal you know, calendar so that they can attend to everything. However, their stress accompanies them throughout and does not allow them to, uh, to be present or enjoy the task or their whole day. So your stress will show up in your body, tone of voice, facial expressions, and facial muscles, choice of words, and often your results. Therefore, allowing for pressure release techniques throughout the day is so necessary. Try deep breathing, listening to comedy, putting on relaxing music, exercising, jumping up and down on a small trampoline, walking outside in some green area and maybe a 20 minute nap can help you boost your energy or release excess stress or anxiety. So when your day's done, take a warm or a hot shower or a bath, soothe yourself and replenish your body and soul and appreciate and validate your job well done. For more observational and integrative skills, get my book, Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life that you want. <laughs> Oh, 
welcome back everyone. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain and I am so excited to have Dr. Mohamed Nami with me today. He is the head of the Department of Neuroscience at School of Advanced Medical Science and Technologies in Shiraz University of Medical Sciences in Shiraz, Iran. And he is also serves at the National Brain Mapping Lab Advisory Board Member for Neuroscience. He is currently a fellow EWHC at Harvard Medical School. And guess what? Recently, just a couple of days ago, has been uh, become a member, um, an honorary member of the Alpha Kappa Delta Honor Society at Harvard University. His main areas of research and clinical practice are neuroscience of sleep, neurobiological aspects of sleep, disorders and related neurocognition assessments intervention. It is a joy to have you join us, Dr. Nami. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Fujian. That's a matter of uh, uh, pride for me to be part of this conversation. Very much thank you for having me here. I know that you're... Um your expertise in sleep disorders, but you have recently um, published a paper in the Journal of Advanced Medical Sciences and Applied Technologies with the title of Love and Fear as Portrayed by Affective Neuroscience. Now, uh, obviously emotions as a therapist are one of the most keen aspects that I work with and especially the concept of love, whether it comes out in a romantic love or just, you know, love and compassion altogether. So I was really interested in your, in your paper, especially because you also, uh, through the paper, um, look at one of the um, um, Antonio Damasio, who um, I've, you know, I've uh, talked to on our show before, and I'm really a fan, a big fan of. And um, so I really enjoyed your work and your paper and, and the, what you have published. So I wanted to um, talk to you about that and kind of for us to share a little bit for our audience about your findings uh, regarding two of these distinct emotions, which are love and fear. In one, what way you have found them to be similar as an emotion, and you've also found them to be different and come in different types of categories. Can you share with us a bit? Yeah, let's uh, put it this way. Being a fan of Dr. Professor Antonio Damasio and other influential neuroscientists in the field, I can tell that you are not alone. So many people are following the you know, structured hypothesis that they have put into place for uh, justifying the neural networks and the mechanism that they are going hand in hand just to identify uh, the way how we are feeling and how, how we behave. So uh, it's a matter of just putting together the ideas how behavior, cognition, and emotion are going hand in hand. So it, when we're discussing about the trilateral, like a link between these three main categories and faculties of our mental being, it's really important to uh, have general understanding about the uh, like the underpinning mechanisms that they are formulating this kind of things in our brain. When it comes to cognition, we 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 got to be touching on cognitive health when we. We are, when we have a good, uh, you know, um, status for our mental health regarding our memory, attention, learning, and executive functions, reasoning, and planning, and decision making, and so on and so forth, but that is not the only player in the scene. We would better say that emotion is not only a player on the scene, but that's the director of what's happening in the brain. So putting that together and leveling that up with behavior, we've got to have a quality control of the behaviors that we are showing. So it's like a production line. So our brain processes things, will capture, will just do the data acquisition, and that goes on the processing in the brain that it is just being, well, you know, kind of glazed with the matter of emotion and how we're uh, just making the final outcome of this production line is the behavior. So uh, for me as a cognitive neuroscience, neuroscientist and cognitive neuromedicine practitioner for the past 10, 15 years, uh, I've been well focusing on a matter of sleep. And, you know, there, there are not really isolated domains. When we're talking about sleep, definitely we talk about our, our state of our being, which is uh, well entangled with REM sleep. And during the REM sleep, what we have is the emotional processing. So we have a bunch of compelling evidence showing that in REM sleep, where we're dreaming, a rapid eye movement sleep, our brain would put our data into a form of, of pre-processing and processing. So it's like an activation synthesis. So we come up 
with some retrieval of the information and data that we are just reviewing them in form of dreams and fantasies. And based on those dreams and fantasies, uh, no matter what, we're daydreaming or we're night dreaming, we're just forming our goals and our perspectives. So when we love something where we are passionate about it, so this passion, this inner flow, uh, and uh, this, this self-motivation, motivational structures that we're depending on when we're pursuing a goal or objective, these are really adding something to our, uh, you know, uh, like, maternal, uh, like a material success. So uh, these are, well, you know, interdigitated concepts. And that's why as a uh, neuroscience practitioner, I start to think about different aspects of emotion, cognition, and tying them back to the concept of sleep. Recently, with as you said, yeah, as you said, with some of our colleagues, recently we we published a paper on love and fear as some substrates of emotion, and that is pretty much to our interest. And that would be that would be very nice to talk about it here if if we can have a chance to. We have um, based on Demosia's work and uh, and your work also, as I see it. Um, it seems to be two different types of emotions we're talking about. One uh, is the sex set of original emotions uh, that show up um, as an, um, let's say, which fear is one of those emotions also, which shows up based on uh, survival skills or uh, create the maintaining of survival skills and coming to homeostasis. And then there's also another, which then the cognition gets in and also has right. its own interpretation of right. the emotions as are happening, reality checking, do I really need, you know, is this emotion accurate or not or valid or is it something happening? And then um, the behavior as I'm, also sensing that it happens on both. So behavior sometimes without necessarily the cognition being in the middle, the behavior shows up with the emotion as an immediate need of survival base when automatically shows up or uh, that it comes up after the cognition has had some interpretation and has some meddling in the middle where then it gears our, emotion, uh, our behaviors toward a certain goal. Um, so when we're talking about the love and fear, um, is it true that with fear, uh, most of the emotions as it shows up in a survival mechanism and it goes into the behavior, but then when it comes into love, that there is a more of a complex uh, processing that happens in, in our brain and the cognition. So the combination has a more complex aspect versus maybe um, the, the emotion of fear. Yeah, the question is really fundamental, and, and that's a very important question to tap into, yet so far in neural science research, empirical evidence, it does not really have something big to offer in that, in that perspective. But what we know is that, right, you, you, what, you, what you pointed out is valid. Uh, based on the, uh, the models which have been proposed by uh, Damasio and Carvalho and also by other scientists like Joseph Lado, what we know that we, we are talking about two different mechanisms, two different pathways, if you like. So one of them is more based on the, uh, the drive and the survival that what we're all doing is as a matter of like putting yourself in a secure and safe place to stay alive and to keep on with our with our goals and achievements all right and these are very very fundamental basic needs that people have to stay away from danger when some when when we're for example imagine that we are in in a, like a, in the dangerous situation uh, a crown beer is approaching us and what we do is that we we just uh, you know fix in place we freeze and then we run so if we got a courage we got a tool for that we go for battling that that fear that threat but most of the time we run away so this freezing in place or run and freeze and run is something which happens in a short circuit in our brain that just connects the a very deep structured areas of the brain in the lateral uh, i mean temporal parts of the brain mainly limbic structure we have a very small structure there which is called amygdala and amygdala is just you know streamlining the pathway when we are reacting to a dangerous stimulus so by that uh, based on Damasio's model, 
uh, everything is right short circuited. So we are just doing everything based on our drives and to staying away uh, of danger and, and just to, for, the, for the purpose of survival. But what uh, uh, Cavallo, uh, but what, what Joseph Ladeau points out is that uh, some, some other aspects of emotions are more intricated, as, as you indicated, some like love. We are talking about emotion processing, and emotion processing are referred to as our feelings. So the feeling is where the, the temporal structures in the brain, the limbic cortices, are in close contact with the neocortex, with the frontal parts of the brain. And these are where we got this conflict. So the conflict, you know, let me be clear on that. Conflict is, uh, is something that we need to we need to think of how to do resolution for a conflict. And love and emotion are very very entangled with the with the concept of conflict reg uh, regulation, uh, conflict resolution. So imagine that someone is attacking me. He likes to attack me. He likes to beat me. I don't like to be beaten, right? So this is like a conflict. So I just want to just make a resolution for this conflict and stay uh, away from danger and get the best out of this. Uh, and for this, sometimes uh, we, we see that the cortical brain or the new cortex, a co our cognitive brain is taken over and we're thinking more logically, cognitively, and we're deciding based on our cognition. It's more mathematically and logically processed in the brain. So in that case, we're not going to go emotionally, if, if, if you would agree. And many instances when we're uh, you know, approaching something, or, uh, or 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 we're in the position to do to do defense. In that case, uh, our cortex is just staying aside, and the brain is being hijacked by amygdala, by some other structures that they are well deep seated into the limbic cortices. So by that, we we gotta be uh, serving ourself as an organism to stay from uh, danger and to approach our, our goals or our, our, our achievements. So this is like uh, two processes when we're talking about emotions. One is the, the, the approach mechanisms and the other is the defense mechanisms. And uh, when, when, uh, when we are setting off uh, from the uh, sympathetic nervous system, we're forming uh, uh, a kind of you know, emotional status that we are in the position of making relationship with the other. We're sitting back, relax, and we can do further processing of the emotions. So these are the pleasant emotions most at a time. So sometimes love is a is a conscious processing of uh, instinctual uh, you know uh, motives in the brain and, and motivational structures in the brain. We do not only love uh, things; we love people, we love places, and this is away from the concept of romantic love. So as we are approaching as uh, the concept of love uh, and fear, we would. We would, uh, we would be kind of touching on the concept that the basic the neural structures in the brain are about staying alive, perceiving, also em emoting and thinking and acting. And these are all going hand in hand to make us uh, a more productive person to, to approach and to pursue our goals, objectives, and our dreams, in, in a sense. And I sense that um, in a prior uh, <clears throat> lecture of yours that I was uh, you know, part of, um, I also heard from you that said the concept of romantic love has the extra element of attachment to it. And um, so when it comes to, the, uh, to, ha to ha experiencing the love and then putting the attachment side by side with it, uh, that's where kind of romantic love gets created. And is that is that because of the complexity of all of it, it finds itself in a um, not only from the drive perspective. So it's a little bit more of uh, not only the survival based feelings, but now it becomes um, a feeling which is processed with a lot more of the elements around it. Is that what I got from you? Absolutely. Yeah. When we uh, are approaching the topic of love, uh, it is, uh, or attachment, or maybe attraction to something or someone, it's not only about the, the human being. When From the evolution or neuroscience perspective, we see that all the vertebrates or the animals, they have the sense of attachment. They do mating and they do reproduction. 
But the thing is that they do not have any sort of like, uh, you know, uh, ethical or a kind of, uh, you know, uh, attachment in a sense that, well, this person whom I love, I'm not going to li leave him alone or leave her alone. I'm going to promise that I'll take care of him or her and I'm going to stay the rest of my life with him or her. This is only for human because we're thinking about the ethical. We're thinking about some, some uh, we're digging in, into more, you know, deep down uh, aspects of emotional processing. So these are something which are, uh, which are not only about our sex drive. So we, we are talking about the matter of love from three different perspectives. Number one is the sex drive, which is a very important element there. The second is the attraction system. And the third one is the attachment system. So we're, when we're talking about the concept of romantic love, it's more of sex drive and attraction system. All right. And then when it comes to matter of, you know, uh, liking or loving someone in a sense that we're not going to get, uh, uh, you know, uh, detached from that uh, romantic relationship. So in that sense, what we do is that we are uh, adding the element of attachment to that. I don't know if there's something like a problem with my light. Yeah, it's okay though. It, it keeps flashing, so we keep giving you, it's as if it's taking a picture of you. So there I don't you. know. I don't know. Okay. Okay. That's fine. So let's keep going. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, one of the things that uh, showed up to, for me as you were talking is the element, and if you have done any studies and looked at it from the perspective of, um, is there a difference between the love, the romantic love, and passion? as um, from a neuroscientist place, as you're looking at this, do you see a difference between passion and the love? So passion is, uh, is uh, more uh, predominantly, it is referring to kind of things that we're doing. All right. So we're passionate about the things that we're pursuing, about the goals, about our fantasies. Uh, and, but, but, uh, but the, another issue that we're approaching is, uh, the romantic law for romantic love, for certain passion is a part of it. Passion is one of the constraints of romantic love, but when it comes to, uh, like, uh, uh, romantic love per se, attachment and sex drive is definitely a part of it. So we, we are not pretty much certain that uh, when we are passionate about something, we love it in a sense that we're engaged in a romantic love concept. So romantic love is more about male, female, uh, you know, attachment. And of course, sex drive is a part of it. And uh, when sex drive is the only player in the scene, then we do not see, let me, let me check this one maybe for a second. I hope that we're, we're doing fine. Okay, so when we're, when we're talking about the concept of romantic love, then uh, only, only the concept, only the substrate of, of uh, uh, like uh, sex drive and attraction are not always there. Some other times we, we have another element, which is the element of attachment. And for the element of attachment, we, when we have this kind of, you know, uh, entanglement with the concept that, well, this is a part of my inner values. This is something that I'm ethically attached to. I'm not going to put that aside. I am kind of, you know, uh, 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 committed for this. But you don't see that in animals. In the mating season, they, they find their mates and they have their territory. Uh, they do the mating and after that, they are just, you know, uh, okay, it's gone. And next year, they're going to find another mate and, and go if this goes on and on. But for a human being, it's the story is kind of like different. Got it. So the other um, concept that shows up for me, and I don't know if you've done any research, but if you haven't, I'd love to do so this some research with you on this. It's also the element of addiction, where I have seen a lot of work with addiction for the past 30 years. And I've seen also the concept of the attachment, passion, and addiction come close. Now, there's a lot of research that has been done from the dopamine aspect of it, but coming from the emotional aspect of it, I found that many people who be, you know, have maybe addictive personality kind of, or that they are the people who at one point become addicted to something, they also have this element of passion and attachment as part of their personality. Have you done any research on this or can share your knowledge about this piece? Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, when we're talking about the addiction, 
it's like an attentional emotional bias to something. And it's not only a, dr a, a drug addiction, it could be about anything, all right? So people have this emotional at attentional bias towards something. And that's because attention is playing a critical role here. So if we want to say that I'm overtly attended to something and I'm seeking for it and I'm looking for it all the time and I'm just spending money and time on it. So that is because it's part of my value. I, I really enjoy it. But when I'm overtly attended and biased to something, uh, this this needs to have a compartment. This needs to have a constraint of uh, like a constituate of, of emotion behind it. So if in one in one sense, we can say that emotion is a gate for gateway for attentional performance. So when emotion is there, then I'm emotionally attached to some kind of issues, motives and substrates. Then by that, I'm going to be overtly attended to that. Then I pre-process and reprocess and reverberate all these data all and all, uh, you know, uh, on and on again in my brain. And by that, I'm going to be super conscious about this as a as a motive which is going to be giving me pleasure so pleasure and positive feeling is something that i feel motivation for that so these are generally referred to as motivational structures so when we're talking about motivational structures definitely there are some uh, different uh, aspects here we have adaptive motivational structures and we have maladaptive motion, motivational structures. Someone is in love with sports. Someone is in love with, with pets or reading books or doing meditation or whatever, all right? And, and, the, and the, uh, the other side of the story is that a person is using and applying maladaptive motivational structures. And this is something the person is, is following just to fill in the gaps of some of the emotional uh, drives that he or she has been looking for, but that's not been found in regular life. So the person is going to find a streamline or something to approach to uh, uh, one clue which is going to provide him with the pleasure that he or she is seeking for. But the brain is hardwired for a distinct amount of pleasure. So if I'm overloading my brain with pleasure by time, this, the, the hardwiring of the brain would not respond anymore to that level of pleasure. And by time, I'm going to increase the dose of the drug. I'm going to get addicted. I'm going to get dependent to that. I'm not enjoying that anymore. I'm just using substrate and drugs to stay normal. And this is the like roller coaster. And this is like the flip flop that we get, in, uh, you know, uh, 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 stuck in. So that is why addiction is not, is not always uh, welcome. So, and people who are addicted to something and they have this obsessive, uh, you know, uh, uh, like like compassion or a passion towards something. And they find that, well, they're putting much of their energy and, and drive and time and money into it. And by that, they are seeking help from the professionals. Like, okay, help me. Um, I'm getting stuck in a kind of behavior that's taking much of my time and I'm not having any opportunity to deal with my other objectives or goals or dreams or fantasies. And all my life is about getting the drugs or getting that specific. Th these might be about like... Uh, whatever uh, a behavior that we can we can uh, you know refer to for example people have sex addiction food addiction they would have uh, you know uh, uh, like obsessive yeah different kind of things so and by that people would would seek clinical attention and also they would seek help from the experts to help them get rid of that excessive over and over repetitive behavior and that's why addiction is is as normally referred to as a, as a, as a disorder and it's not it's like, it's like a dysregulated emotion from for, at the first place then when it goes on and on when we have the progression of the dysregulated em, emotional perspectives then the person will get stuck into disordered uh, uh, status and by time he will be diseased he'll be like a mental mentally ill person and that's the that's the problem when we're struggling when when we are uh, using much of our energy or time to help those people to get rid of that repetitive, obsessive, and addictive behavior. So let's go into now your uh, expertise, which is sleep. Um, it's one of the most important uh, 
you know, fact and, and element and behavior that any human being can do in order to be mentally healthy and let alone physically healthy, but even mentally healthy. I mean, we know Absolutely. that if you wanted to get somebody really unhealthy, you know, starve them from, from sleep and they probably go psychotic. So I know many research have been done about the importance of sleep, not only for you know, uh, not going psychotic and not becoming, uh, you know, uh, going for, through early dementia and Alzheimer's and all of the brain diseases. But also one thing you said, which was very important at the beginning, this is where we process everything at, at night. So every information that we kind of capture during the day, during our sleep, it gets processed. And then it gets into our filing system in a sense. And, and, and that's why sleeping is so important. And then dreaming is so important in a sense. So when we talk about um, sleep hygiene, which has become one of the most important facts with uh, human beings at this point, because of high levels of stress, uh, because of uh, the you know electronics that are beside us at every moment at, um, and we could be with them until the minute that we want to fall asleep uh, because of uh, high stress levels of life um, it's become much more difficult for people to fall asleep or stay asleep um, mm -hmm. so what are some of the um, latest research that you can let us know about? not only the importance of it, but also sleep hygiene in how people who are listening to us and viewing us can, um, can support themselves into getting a good hygiene on that. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. That's a really critical issue to, to address. And for, for sleep issue, uh, you know, strictly speaking, we're facing a pandemic of insufficient sleep. So people are using, they're overloading themselves with technology. They're not following good sleep hygiene measures and uh, they don't follow a regular sleep-wake schedule. They are, you know, attending meetings or traveling across time zones. And this is something, or they are, they are you know, uh, you know, flooding themselves into social media. Their screen time is off the chart and uh, they are not following good sleep habits. It's not only a sleep habit, which is not, really there as an as an optimal uh, way of treating our health or general mental health but also our diet habits our physical exercise these are these are the things that we need to uh, be, be uh, you know uh, be accurately aware of the other things are uh, using uh, uh, you know substances also uh, smoking and alcohol or maybe over drinking or not drinking re responsibly or people are not able to just manage and control their stress uh, you know uh, levels and they go really angry everything which is uh, which is really minuscule they, it, it would drive them up the wall so they throw objects they, they raise their voice and also they they shout at the people they get physically uh, you know uh, uh, the, the involved with something which which they would regret later on so these are the things that they are overall referred to as the brain health index so when our brain health index which is a cumulative Relative scoring of this kind of measures and pillars, if you like. There are six pillars, physical activity and diet habits, sleep hygiene, uh, using smoking or drug abuse or, or substance use, also alcohol use and stress management. When we're not doing fine all, different, uh, all, all those six different pillars, then our brain health index is not as it has to be. And uh, and by that, people will, will, will have the consequences of this poor poor mental health status on on every different pillar for example when it comes to the matter of sleep they wouldn't find it easy to fall asleep or to maintain sleep sometimes uh and deliberately they wake up early in the morning so they have early morning awakening during the day they have sleep propensity in the morning they have this sleep inertia they have excessive sleep uh, during the day, they cannot well focus, their concentration and memory performance is not as it has to be. And, and by time they feel that their personal productivity is, is, is not there. So in, when it comes to emotional health, sleep is a part of it. As we referred to that before, uh, we are just turning into processing mode in our brain when we sleep 
as uh, whereas during the daytime, we are in the acquisition mode. So we, we capture the data, we file in the data, and we process and reprocess those, those data when specifically we're referring to the emotional data. They are being reprocessed during REM sleep. And REM sleep is a very interesting part of our sleep because we got structure in our sleep. We have the, our, structure, our, our sleep is well engineered, is well structured. We have different uh, you know, stages of sleep. Stage one, two, and three, these are non REM or non dreaming part of our sleep. And we have REM sleep which is a rapid eye movement or dreaming part of the sleep. Interestingly, in our uh, REM sleep, our brain is uh, just kind of identically active as we're awake. And just looking at the brain waves, we cannot distinguish whether the person is in the wake stage or in a REM stage. We gotta be looking at different sleep parameters. For example, body paralysis or rapid eye movement. And also we do the camera surveillance from the uh, from the patient or a referral at the sleep lab and then by that we would distinguish that, well that person now is in the REM sleep stage she is not awake so just looking at the brain waves it's very difficult to distinguish whether the person is in awake or is in REM sleep and that's pretty much interesting because brain is overtly active during REM sleep and some structures of the brain specifically are our little guy uh, amygdala that we just mentioned that little while before uh, in the in the temporal cortex of the brain in the limbic structure amygdala is a part of the brain which is literally active in the in in our uh, like REM sleep also we have some other sectors of the anterior cingulate area which is what a middle part of our brain we got a structure which is called anterior cingulate and this is also active there is an other very tiny nucleus in the brain called nucleus accumbens this is also a part of this this inner play of this structural activity and network activity within REM sleep, and we have the hypothalamus. Why I'm saying this? Because these structures that we just enlist here are structures that are critically important in the processing of our emotions, okay? So our emotional control, our emotion regulation, our cognitive emotion regulation during the daytime is at least partly dependent to how proper we are having our sleep and we are just going through this REM processing. Interestingly, according to the data which has been published in the Journal of uh, 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 Na Nature Medicine uh, some years back, it has been shown that uh, those people who have uh, depression or have dysregulated emotion, a range of affective disorders like uh, uh, anxiety, PTSD, or depression, uh, maybe phobias and obsessive compulsive disorders, they are over dreaming. So this means that the brain is overtly processing their emotional constructs during REM sleep. So this over, -pro over processing of emotion means that emotions are being exaggerated and emotions are being, you know, overtly processed. And by that, part of our behavior are being affected by this overt emotional processing during uh, REM sleep. And that holds true for the addicted people for the addicted patients that they are referring, I mean, uh, substance abusers. We're giving them what? We're giving them medications that kind of shrinks the period of time that the, that the patient is, is, is spending in REM sleep. So we give the medication in the morning, but the, the carry-on effect of that medication, which is, which is predominantly effective to the neural transmitter, a chemical system in the brain co called serotonin system, that carries on the effect over to night and during sleeping hours and well into REM sleep. So by that, the REM sleep is getting decreased, the proportion of REM sleep is decreased, and then the brain has less chance to reprocess and overtly process uh, the emotional inputs that the, that the person has received during the day. So over-processing of uh, dreaming uh, or, or emotional inputs or emotional memory reprocessing during REM sleep what does that mean in an addicted person? It means craving during the day. So when the, when the guy wakes up in the morning, and all he or she is doing is looking for the substance, all right? Or looking for that specific addictive behavior. Uh, maybe that's like, our, I don't know, porn addiction or uh, 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 drug addiction. It might be food addiction or whatever addiction it is. So the people will get really stuck in repetitive obsessive behavior, which is which is part, at least partly, of stemming into the emotional memory processing that he or she had, has had during REM sleep. And that's kind of interesting. Okay, 
Dr. Nami, if, um, if somebody does not want to take medication, um, is there any other um, healthy way of um, reducing uh, the over uh, examination or processing of emotions in a REM sleep? Yeah, we can, we can kind of modulate the brain waves. So we're nothing but uh, our memories. We're nothing but a chemistry. We're nothing but electricity and we're nothing but vibrations. So what I'm talking about is the vibrations or the brain oscillations. That feels so good to the meaning that we put on ourselves and our character and identity. <laughs> that is in fact, yeah, you're right, you bet. So the way that our brain oscillates in different areas of the brain, either the cortical areas or subcortical areas, that goes hand in hand with our emotional processing, with our emotional uh, 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 memory processing, if you like, specifically during sleep. So when it comes to uh, frontal limbic areas of the brain, we have some, uh, you know, uh, uh, empirical evidence showing that over, uh, uh, you know, uh, like like uh, delta oscillation and also theta oscillation in that areas of the brain, specific the left temporal parts of the brain, it is uh, kind of uh, re related to the emotional processing status. So when when someone is dreaming. And I see the signals on the monitor and the, and the subject is just staying uh, there, lying on a bed and is, is sleeping next door. And I'm in the monitoring room and I'm looking at the data real time. And I see, well, this person is now in the REM stage. He's dreaming and he has overt uh, production or predominance of theta activity or delta activity in the left temporal cortex in this area of the brain. So if there is an opportunity that in a day after or during the following weeks, we use some neurotechnology or neuromodulation, and we're trying to kind of entrain the, the, the pattern of the oscillations in that areas, in that cortical networks and subcortical areas of the brain using this kind of technologies. That might be putting some electrodes on the brain or using transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial electrical stimulation, using some less technical uh, stuff like uh, meditation, yoga, or mindfulness-based cognitive training or, or kind of, you know, uh, audiovisual entrainment or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, like, like attention training or cognitive, uh, cognitive rehabilitation training or something like that. Maybe EMDR for the people who are, uh, EMDR is a sort of like techniques which has been in place in psychology for years. And we're using, you know, eye movement repositioning and desensitization. It is still in practice in many areas of the world. So we are, we're submitting the people to this kind of technologies, to these kind of, you know, avenues. And when you're using this uh, specific approaches, then you start to feel that, well, there is another way to process emotion. And by that, I'm hearing from you that if, uh, if a person has the ability to regulate their emotion and cognition throughout their awake time and have gained some skills, whether they do it through cognitive or emotional or meditative or go mm -hmm. into interventions such as eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing or um, even neurofeedback or to the more, a little bit more, um, you know, technologies of TMS and all of those, that during the awake time, when the ability to regulate those emotions and cognitions are there, that also passes through the dream and uh, um, uh, it lessens and regulates it also in the REM stage and the dream stage. That is the case, yeah. That is absolutely what is that we, 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 we expect from modulating the brain during wakeful hours and we can, we can see the extended effect of this uh, over sleep. So we see that these brain uh, structures, these neural circuits and neural networks, and also the, the larger scale brain networks in a sense, they are getting kind of, you know, uh, plastically changed. So this is what we, what we refer to as neural plasticity. So it's, it's about changing the chemical structures of the brain or kind of modulating the chemical structures of the brain with or without medications. And then the pattern of the electrical activity in the synapse in the synapses or synaptic level will change then the neural circuits will will get changed in the way that they are talking to each other and by that the next status will be uh, changing the brain oscillations and when the brain oscillations are are getting changed and we we measure this using the quantitative electroencephalography or brain mapping or functional
functional F, uh, functional MRI. So when we do this in, in modern neural science, we can we can empirically and we can objectively document well. This has been uh, some evidence showing there's been some evidence showing that the brain structural and functional activity in that specific subject has been kind of modulated, and this is what exactly we we call it neuroplastic neuroplasticity change. The neuroplasticity is really a frontier of all the brain uh, optimization or brain health. In, in many ways, we can help the people to get their, their areas needing improvement really improved. So for example, if I and you were not doing pretty well in our memory and in working memory, for example, we can do some kind of technological plus pharma or only technological uh, approaches, or we can use some sort of, you know, like cognitive behavioral therapies or, or any kind of approach in that realm. And by that, we will see that the brain structure, the brain function, and eventually the chemical system in the brain is, is getting modulated. So when it gets modulated, it is very, very unlikely that we're just getting back to the primitive status and we're just referring uh, to, to our negative thoughts or, or worrying, distress, worries, and, and something like that. So by this, we are helping the people to overcome their, their insufficiencies whether for the cognitive or emotional or behavioral aptitude. Sometimes I and you, we're doing pretty well, let's say, in our memory or in emotion control. Question is, can we do even better? And literally in modern neuroscience, there has been a very, very, you know, uh, 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 noticeable uh, strive and a swing towards using technologies and state-of-the-art approaches in modern neuroscience to get the people get empowered. So this is called brain training or brain empowerment. So when people, they are just doing fine and they can be even better, they can be even more executive in the way that they are, that they are uh, you know, regulating their emotion, cognition, and behavior. Not only that, but also motor system and sensory system. Well, um, we um, don't have as much time that I want to. I probably need to talk to you about 10 more hours, but unfortunately we don't have it. There's one question that um, I get asked a lot, so I'm giving it to you. Um, there's this conversation that the seventh hour and the eighth hour of sleep are the most important. So if you're going, you know, please sleep, uh, you know, your eight hours or seven hours and the last two hours are the most important. Why? So uh, in terms of the total sleep time, there is like a normal distribution in the, in the world population. So if we we'll look at the, the empirical evidence from epidemiological point of view or from uh, uh, small scale research that been done across the world, you'll see that people overall, if it, you know, the number of hours that we need to sleep differs uh, and that is, that, is, that is varying as per uh, different age span. So across lifespan, we would need different hours of sleep need. But let's say if we and you, uh, uh, at like a middle-aged young people, uh, generally they have between somewhere like six to eight hours of sleep. But question is, it's like a bell-shaped normal distribution of the number of hours that a person will, would need. So just only like 2.5% of the people will need less than six hours or more than 10 hours of sleep, just 2.5% percent, percent of the population. Otherwise, the people would need somewhere six to eight hours, let's say seven hours. So if I and you, we are sticking to this uh, at least seven hours of our sleep need, okay, we're doing fine. So I'm not in depth, indebted to my sleep need or I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not having this sleep insufficiency. So by that, if I'm just charting my hours of sleep every night, tonight I have like two hours lack of sleep, so I'm minus two. Tomorrow I will catch up plus two hours of sleep just to, you know, just to pay this uh, debt back and a day after and day after. Evidence has been, has been substantial substantiated in the fact that when a person has got accumulative sleep debt for eight, 48 hours within, within uh, uh, like 14 days. 
So if within two weeks, I have the cumulative sleep depth of 48 hours, I will just, you know, crash in terms of my cognitive functions. So it, it is like it is equivalent to the person who has got the alcohol concentration of 0.01% in his blood. So if we do not sleep well and we sleep, keep on being in sleep depth by, by two weeks for 48 hours, then we need to catch up that sleep and we need to pay this, uh, this, this uh, depth. And the dividend is high, you know what I mean? It's not easy. So when, when we are in, in sleep debt for long run, then we're going to face so many predicaments with regards to the risk of heart and uh, uh, you know stroke and heart attack, also diabetes, obesity, uh, we have so many different uh, evidence showing that lack of sleep would result in, uh, you know, uh, some 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 sort of specific cancers and so on and so forth. Hypertension. But people who are asking you to, and asking me this question: How many hours do I need to sleep? The answer is probably: Listen to yourself. So if you're okay with six hours, okay, just go for six hours. But if if you are not doing fine and by time you feel that you need to catch up more sleep, just stick to your biology. And uh, some people, they are very, very scarcely uh, doing fine unless you are taking less than five hours of sleep. But the number of those people are, is not high. So we need to, uh, let's agree on this. Sleep is an, our undisputable right. And we need, to, we need to stick to that. We need to get the use of our sleep to let the brain refurbish, to, to let the brain get repaired and restored. And not only do that, but to enjoy the hours of sleep that we're having. Sometimes when we, uh, when we sleep, we have pleasure. And that, that is what we all have experienced. So sleep is as a, like a pleasurable slumber. And it's like very sweet, right? So, uh, and that, 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 that has also something to do with emotions if we're going to wrap up later on. Beautiful. Um Thank you so much for uh, wonderful knowledge that we got around um, emotions and sleep. Uh, we are pretty much out of time unless I take on the next uh, the next person's time, which I can. Um, it was a joy to have you. It's a, always uh, you know a learning process for me as I speak with you. And um, thank you for taking the time. I know that you are about uh, eleven hours and a half uh, away from us, so. Uh, thank you for taking the time and uh, joining us and uh, hope to have you back on our show someday soon. No problem. Uh, I was really pleased for this conversation and I really uh, appreciate the time. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. And for all of you who are with us, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye. Yeah, let's do that. Bye-bye. Togetherness Media. Togethernessmedia.com.